When I started learning about fake news and fake advertising, and when I use those words, I'm not using them with the political uh, connotations, but what they really are, which is completely made up stuff, uh, it seemed like a foreign language to me. So I wanted to explain to you what it is, why it's become so prevalent, this uh, perhaps changed some of your impressions about why it has grown, because it's not just a bunch of uh, Russian hackers in the Ukraine. This is a very sophisticated business. Hundreds of millions of dollars are made on me alone every year, and I'm just one of many folks who are taking advantage of it. And I'll explain why that happens. And as you begin to understand uh, the pernicious uh, elements of this, it'll start to come alive. You'll probably feel a little agitated. But the good news is we can do things, and the reason this event is so important is because I don't think it can be just done by, as an example, physicians, healers, healthcare professionals trying to clean up the system. The neighborhood of the internet's dirty. We need thoughtful, faith-based approaches as well because these are ethical and deeply cultural biases. So for me, the journey started 15 years ago. I had started to do the Oprah show, and just to be clear, I had no interest in doing television. I was a full professor at Columbia University, I still am. I was operating like I am now, I'm not doing as much, but it was enjoyable for me. I, my life was pretty good. I you know, had uh, uh, a journey that I thought was gonna be very fulfilling, the one I was on, and my wife, who's sitting up here, started pestering me because she said many of the patients I was operating on could have avoided the need for my aggressive interventions. I'm a heart surgeon, so I opened their chest with bandsaws. It's a pretty aggressive uh, procedure. And if they had just changed their lives a little bit, it would be different. So I started doing more television. I met Oprah through that experience, and I began making shows with her. She's still my partner today on my show. And 15 years ago, in the middle of a show, innocuous question came up about superfoods. And I mentioned something called acai. Have you, how many of you have heard of acai? And by the end of the day, I was selling acai berry, which reduced aging, improved virulence, uh, dealt with erectile dysfunction, hair loss, skin, I mean, all kinds of benefits I didn't even realize existed, and I was selling it. And this became a gargantuan snowball of product sales. And uh, I started getting upset about it because I realized that uh, these products were being sold in part uh, be, uh, because I had never sold anything, even to this day, Many of you think I sell products online, because if you Google my name, and please don't, because you'll start getting spammed immediately, uh, you'll start getting these fake news bits and or, you know, advertisements claiming I'm selling things. And the reason they were, I've learned, is people who are influential, yes, but more importantly, don't have other products they're selling, are especially vulnerable, because if you're not selling anything, as Max pointed out before I walked out here, nature abhors a vacuum, it fills it. So fake products make perfect sense if they're coming from me, because I don't have my own products. So it becomes a perfect storm. People who, and I didn't sell products, I still don't sell products because I didn't think a doctor would be as trusted if they sold products. And yet here I am selling everything you can imagine under the sun. After a million dollars of expenditures before the show launched, you can only imagine what I've spent since, I got no, no uh, success. And the reason is because selling fake products with you, someone else's name and image is perfectly legal. And th that's because there's a rule in the United States, it has been historically been true around the world, called Section 230, which says basically, this was passed in 1996, that there has to be freedom for the internet to nurture this beginning nascent process that so powerfully could help humans. We need to exempt them from the usual laws of media. So if the New York Times were to run an advertisement claiming that Robin Smith sells an anti-aging cream because she looks so wonderful, then she'd have to have call them, but they would have to take the ad down. That's not true in the internet. The internet is considered a dumb pipe. By that I mean uh, the internet companies are thought of as fax machines or billboards. If the billboard has a fake advertisement on it, you cannot sue the billboard manufacturer. You can only try to get the billboard uh, poster down. But it's a very cumbersome, not very efficient process. Most of us would agree that Google and Facebook are not like fax machines but that's how they are legally treated. That changed for the first time this month. First little kink started. So let me show you the first video. This is a video about an effort that I made with uh, other influential individuals to go after the actual scammers themselves, to give you an idea of the kinds of people we're dealing with. This is called fake uh, ads, and it's, a, it's a, a series of investigations we've conducted on the show. Today, a stunning revelation 
in the fight against the online scammers that sell you products with fake celebrity advertisements. Ads like these that not only trick you out of your hard-earned money, but could even be dangerous. Now, it's been my mission for nearly a decade to stop the companies behind these counterfeit celebrity endorsements that have invaded the internet. Now, the government has stepped in to bust one of the biggest companies scamming you. Bombshell headlines, a long time in the making. The FTC is taking action against one of the most egregious companies swindling you out of your hard-earned money by making fake celebrity endorsements of products like face creams and supplements. This is a tangled internet scam that I've personally been trying to unravel for years. Is Richard around? Uh, I haven't seen him. Uh, you know where Richard is? Three years ago, I knocked down the doors of the company Tar Inc. because they were illegally using my name and face to market a bogus version of a weight loss supplement called Garcinia Cambogia. Have you ever put my picture on your website, or any website that you're involved with? The uh, client might have been using the video, but that's no longer the case. Well, how, would you, how would you feel if I took your picture and put it on a website and said you endorsed something? I've never you used did. your picture. You just said you did. Then, last season, our investigative team sent shark Barbara Corcoran to San Diego to bite back at another company using her face to sell a product. You've been using my name and my face to market the crap out of your face cream. Do you have my permission? No, no, I don't. Uh... Why would you do that? And now, finally, a huge victory. The FTC just announced a judgment against Tar Inc the same company I went after for duping consumers out of $179 million. The question becomes, why? How does this all work? How do these guys get away with it? Uh, what are the mechanisms that are out there? And very specifically, how have fake ads led to fake news? And that's the big transition that we're seeing. And I'm not talking about fake news as defined politically. I'm talking about literally made up stuff where there's no validity to it. So I was able to attract a man named Justin Kohler. He's a notorious fake news writer. He makes articles up. He was the one who wrote the articles about Hillary Clinton stuffing the ballot boxes in Ohio during the last election that got Republicans so incensed, got Republicans, made them aware that Hillary was cheating in the election, they thought. And uh, it's interesting because Justin Kohler is a uh, avowed Democrat. I wasn't a Republican. This was not about political ideology. He did it for one very specific reason. Let's play the video, Fake News. This is him on my stage. Now, in order to help you escape the fake news money scam, we need to get inside the head of someone who writes and spreads fake news. That's why I invited Justin Kohler to be here today. He's a CEO who has created more than a dozen fake news websites. He's a staff of people who all work to create clickbait fictional news stories. Thank you for being here. Thanks for having me. So how'd you get started in the fake news business? Well, uh, several years ago, 2012, I uh, came interested in what is now considered the alt-right. Uh, I noticed lots of websites that were publishing stories that were fiction in nature uh, against Obama or against Democrats in general. And I was curious about how those stories uh, spread. So I launched my own site and uh, really was interested in seeing how easy it was to kind of infiltrate uh, the right-wing bubble, uh, as it were. But you're, you're a Democrat, I understand. I am. You voted for Hillary in the last election. I did. So you didn't find it awkward that you were writing articles condemning her or supporting alt-right ideas about the country? Uh, I did not. Uh, you know, studies have shown since the election that uh, fake news doesn't necessarily influence uh, turnout, didn't have any... Uh, influence on the election itself. Um, really, this was something that, uh, you know, myself and a group of friends, we were having fun doing and uh, just continue doing it. What kind of traffic do you get? What's, what's the most hits you've got on one of your fake news pieces? Well, since I launched uh, my flagship site, National Report, in 2013, we've hit about 100 million page views. Uh, our best ever story hit about 6 million. 100 million? Yes, sir. And you say you don't think that it changed the election, but 100 million people reading articles is, you know, going to change some minds. Well, really, these stories exist to confirm people's already 
uh, confirm biases that people already have, right? Uh, so, uh, for instance, a negative story about Hillary during the election wasn't going to change a Hillary supporter into voting for Donald Trump. Uh, the stories that were positive or, or anti-Donald Trump weren't going to change someone's opinion to vote for him. Uh, really, these just work to confirm something that someone already believes. It doesn't necessarily change minds. What do you guys think about that? Doesn't change minds. So I thought I'd check that out. So I had Justin Kohler write me two fake articles. And then I took viewers, and I purposely picked some that were Republican, some were Democrat, left-leaning, right-leaning individuals, but perfectly rational folks. They could be sitting in this audience. There was nothing that was only you know, eccentric about them. And I used these ads. Now, one ad talked about the fact that there was a climate change activist who had proven for, for the first time that climate change irre, irrefutably was caused by humans and that he had evidence uh, of ways of addressing it. Uh, and Donald Trump had imprisoned this man with no lawyer in Washington. And he was not allowed to speak to anybody. He was held in a cell that was known, but uh, no one was talking about. And then I had another ad written that, uh, that this is Justin's ideas. This is about a tunnel, a huge tunnel underneath the American-Mexican wall. And through that tunnel, there were a lot of uh, immigrants that were just running across. There was no border patrol at all. They were all, interestingly, very dark-skinned. I only point that out because they were actually pictures of Ethiopians. There were no Mexicans in the picture. And I specifically wanted that because it begs belief. I mean, if you're going to have a wall under which Latin Americans or uh, Latinos are running underneath, you would think they would look like they were Latinos. These were clearly not. But both these ads ran, and I, I showed these to these two sets of viewers. And then we did something sort of interesting. Uh, working with a, a collaborator, we actually took uh, e quantitative EEG scans. So this is what the setup looks like. And by the way, this woman who has this hat on uh, is a liberal-minded woman who's hearing and reading the article about that poor lawyer, that poor uh, climate change activist who's in jail even today in Washington. And she's very emotional, uh, so hurt by this. And so she has her little hat on. And I'm going to show you something that's riveting. It's the first time I think it has been done. Uh, this is Daniel Amen's work showing what happens inside the brain of someone reading fake news. And this is her brain. Now, the, the, the quantitative EEG on the fake immigration article is on the left. You notice it's all green, which is very calm. No problem. Right? So fake immigration didn't bother this woman. Look at the right. This is the fake, the fake climate change article where the lawyer or the activist was in jail. You see all the red? That is angst. But more importantly, that is the kind of angst that you experience when you are physically threatened. What these fake bits of news had done was to antagonize her in a way that the prefrontal cortex, the, the planning, uh, thoughtful, executive function parts of the brain couldn't deal with. It bypassed all that, bypassed the logic center, and went deep to the reptilian part of our brain, where you, if someone's coming after you with a stick, you just, you move. You react, right? You run away, you fight, you flee, you freeze, but you have an instinctive response. So we shouldn't be surprised that the reactions that we are seeing are not ones that are logical because they're specifically created, these articles and the fake ads, specifically created to get around that usual log jam to people acting. So as we began to, to check these articles out, and by the way, the opposite experience of the brain for the women who were conservative when they read the fake immigration article. Remember what Justin Kohler said? He said it didn't make much of a difference. So this woman, who's actually an executive, the one that you just saw, you should, you know, with the hat on, whose brain scan you're, you're witnessing, uh, I, on the show, they, they didn't realize they were being conned. I, on the show, I asked them their experience. They reflected what we would have predicted. <clears throat> and then I said, I just want to let you know that the articles were fake. And there was this awkward silence. And then the woman whose picture you saw said, well, I'm, I'm taken aback. But I must say, the, the article may have been fake. I'm quoting her. The article may have been fake, but what they were saying was true. So Justin Kohler, in many ways, is saying what he's hearing. Now, it was confirming her bias, and her bias was created by other similar fake pieces. 
So after a while, the fake pieces become the truth. And so you look for fake, other fake pieces that confirm your bias. He, Justin Kohler, went after conservatives uh, and got them riled up because they were easier prey. That's the reason that he went to them. These are folks who often felt more agitated, left out, weren't included. They, they felt their voice wasn't being reflected in, in traditional media. Uh, and so he was able to, to build a fairly big business. But let's understand what the business is. Why would people like Justin Kohler bother learning this, what I'm sharing with you, and taking advantage of it? And this is where it gets really interesting. So to make this accessible, I made it a cartoon, so it's not so scary, but this is exactly what's going on. You have a merchant, let's say they're selling acai berry, <clears throat> and the acai berry wants to get sold, so the merchant's not spending anything on the acai berry production because it's all fake. Because they're gonna lie about what it does, they're gonna lie about what's in it, and that's what we find reproducibly. We run countless tests on the fake products. They're almost invariably, f the material themselves are fake. They, can, they hire an affiliate network, these are large, aggregators who know how to pull together different publishers. Justin Kohler is a publisher. So you get thousands, tens of thousands of publishers who know how to create articles that agitate the audience. They publish articles like the ones you just saw, and that gets consumers like you at the bottom to click. And the more you click, the more they get paid, the more they, the affiliate network takes a little piece of the action, and the more the merchant sells. This is a uh, a, 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 a empire that has been built by several large companies, uh, and it's nefarious, unfortunately, because it's not really illegal in the way we would think about being illegal. In other words, I can't call law enforcement. I've tried. I work with the state's attorneys general. You just can't get anyone to take advantage of this because people figure it's your own problem. I'll get it. I'm okay with that. I'm a big boy. We run a big business. We have to go after these folks. But I'm going to point out a couple problems with the model. First off, the merchants. I mentioned they're acai berry manufacturers, right? They're fly-by-night companies. Not always. In fact, usually they're not. Usually they're the biggest, most respected companies in America. Why? Because a nice company who makes good products, let's say they're athletic apparel, the biggest companies you can imagine, they will say blindly, just get clicks. Just get me some clicks. I don't want to know how you do it, just get me the clicks. So they'll hire the same affiliate networks who hire the same publishers, Justin Kohler, would get people to click through. As they click through, they can just as easily get served an ad for a, a running sneaker as a acai berry. And in fact, that's the bigger money. <clears throat> so now you actually have business models of huge corporations that are legitimate companies making real products using the same affiliate networks, the same publishers of, of fake news, getting to you, instead of with Acai Berry, they're getting to you with their sneakers or their, you know, their, uh, uh, their products. And you, because you're seeing the clicks, and it's cheaper to use these networks, because as we heard yesterday, fake news travels much faster. But now you've created a business, a business where you actually get paid more to make fake news. Now, the biggest problem of all, the biggest issue of all, how do you stop this? You stop this by understanding who's paying the money. Who are the publishers? If you know who the publishers are, you can go to them and say, you're selling sneakers, but you're using illegal networks, so don't give the money to those networks. Use legitimate networks to do this. I did this. And again, I spent a lot of time and a lot of money on this. And I went to Google, and I went to Facebook, and I went to all the biggest companies out there who get business from this. And here's what happens. You go to, let's say, Google, this is a true story. And you say, hey, guys, you're running f fake pieces. I know you don't want to run these fake pieces. Can, you, can I get involved? And at the top level, I've spoken to these folks, and they'll say, yes, we should stop this. It's not good for us either. It makes the neighborhood dirty and dangerous. So let's work together to stop this down. Great. A month later, their lawyers call back. You know, and business affairs calls back. We thought about it. We really don't want to get involved in this. It's not really core to what we're in interested in. And you say, well, this is actually sullying the reputation of the web, which means ultimately you'll pay a price. And they'll say, and they've said this to us, we understand, but we don't want to be in the business of policing the web. And I would get upset about that, but think about it. It's perfectly logical from their perspective. They'd have to spend money to clean up the web, stop down these affiliate networks from running fake ads, and they would lose a lot of money doing it because they can't take the ad revenue. So paradoxically, the biggest companies on the, in the, on, the, on the web, the ones that are not getting criticized, like Facebook for running, you know, using data in a malicious way, are not interested in sharing information that would allow us to clean up the web. 
Literally, they hide the sources of funding. Now ask yourself, what kinds of businesses hide the sources of their funding? Illegal businesses, right? Cocaine dealers don't share supply chain information, right? So we now have a scenario where there's there's a purposeful opaqueness to the web. I don't think what's happened to Facebook recently is an accident. We knew it was coming. We've been yelling about it for more than a decade about fake ads. The fake ads became fake news, as you saw. The business model is traded around this. There's a purposeful hiding of the, res of the source of information, and the lack of transparency is what we're all clamoring down, up and down about. Now, this has led to some interesting changes. And if you think it's not easy, there's a fascinating piece on the web right now where President Obama is saying some really bad stuff. I mean, really just things you'd never imagine him saying. And he's actually not saying it. Jordan Peele, the comedian, used technology to pretend President Obama was saying these things. And you can't tell the difference. It looks just like him. So it's not just about fake ads taking people out of context. You're literally able to get people to say things that they didn't say and then run that as fake ads. So this is becoming a scenario where you cannot even believe your eyes anymore, which is why having ethical conversations around this, having a large, uh, powerful groups of faith opine on this issue is vital because this is beyond a legal issue. It's so fundamentally unethical that it challenges the very way we communicate with each other. And for large media organizations that are legitimate, the New York Times, the Washington Post, the, 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 the papers that are, that are supposed to speak the truth, they're unable to compete because they can't run these fake pieces. So they're on an uneven playing field. This month, for the first time, there was a law uh, passed in the US that challenges the Section 230. There was also a law that goes into effect this summer in Europe that challenges the freedom of the internet to act as a dumb pipe. We have to get loud about this issue because if we don't force large internet companies, both the, the Googles and the Facebooks of the world, but also the product manufacturers to create transparency on the web, we will enter into a cycle where you are unable to believe what you're hearing. Therefore, you don't really have freedom of the press because you don't have any press. Because every little bit of honest press you hear can be quickly drowned up by one-tenth as much of fake news. So that's a high-level review of something that I think you should be aware of. I, I'd love if I can invite Dr. Smith, or Max, I guess Max is coming here, and Monsignor to join me on stage uh, so we can have a, a deeper dive into this for the next 15 minutes or so. And I'm, I'm hoping you found this elucidative. I knew nothing of this when I started my career in media, but it has changed my life dramatically because most of you only know me through these fake ads. And it's probably the, the most that you know about many people whose fake ads you're witnessing right now. I should point out that the, the, the large organization, the interactive uh, group that, can, that re represents the 800 largest internet companies has called aggressively for what I'm asking for, which is for internet companies to clean up the neighborhood on their own. They are, they're arguing that if the internet is not cleaned up by the people who are creating the internet, then government will step in with pretty you know, uh, coarse tools, blunt tools to try to enforce change. And it's not the best way for change to happen on the internet because you're asking a group who doesn't know much about it, how the internet functions to pass laws to try to govern it. And legislating morality is always difficult, which is why uh, the ability, for example, of the Catholic Church and other uh, large organizations of faith to get involved is so vital. So uh, what is, I ask for both, what is the ethical responsibility of serious media to sound the clarion call on this and recognizing that uh, they, they really can't even compete right now because they're not allowed to run these fake news pieces. It would seem that they would want to get aggressive on this. And Monsignor, for the Catholic Church, uh, how ha, has the Catholic Church been uh, vocal about fake ads in particular, not just accusations of fake news, but literally made up news, perverting the news cycle? So Mehmet, my, I think our ethical responsibility, that is almost our main responsibility is to make sure that what we put out is accurate, is the truth. In a way, that, is, that, that almost carries a, a double ethical responsibility. If someone is saying that uh, Trump has jailed the climate change scientist, clearly that hurts somebody and, and it has an impact on our brain. If I then put fake news on about a medical treatment, I'm really directly, in a way, 
practice it doing malpractice on television and can very directly harm people. So we've got a sort of a, a, a double ethical uh, responsibility in, in that regard. Uh, I find it ironic that the true bastions of the free press, the Washington Post, the New York Times, some would argue other, other newspapers, of course, um, are more handcuffed in a way by this than the dumb pipe. Uh, that, that they're the ones that say, well, you know, we, we have nothing, no responsibility here. Uh, I think, as you were saying, that that, that is changing, and I, and I hope so. If I could just point out, I think the reason that the serious media outlets, legitimate media outlets, don't attack the web is there. I've never seen a group feeling so guilty about doing their job as journalists. And they feel that they're competitors because they are. And therefore, they feel conflicted in attacking what is clearly an unfair playing field. But I think they, if, they, if the gloves are not taken off, this is a central moment. If the web is allowed to prosper as it is right now, 99%, 99% of increased ad revenue, digital ad revenue last year, went to Google, Facebook, and Amazon. 99%. So it's not an even playing field. And if there's not an all our attack, uh, almost a holy war on this issue. I don't understand how most of these media companies, the legitimate ones, are going to survive. Then we'll be left with the bottom-feeding elements. It'll actually reinforce bad behavior on the web. Monsignor. Pensando, pensando a questo contesto, thinking of this uh, meeting of uh, physicians, I mean, we're discussing about uh, medical communication, and I think that we can be helped by a very interesting book, The Job of the Reporter. This is the title of the book. This book compares a physician and a journalist, and it says that the physician has an impact on the physical well-being of persons, of patients, and likewise, journalists have an impact upon the mental well-being of the readers. There is a difference, though. That is because journalists are not required to prescribe for the readers what they need to do well in life. Instead, this is what physicians do. They tell their patients what treatments they have to have in order for them to uh, enjoy well-being. Now then, journalists, just like physicians, can poison the readers, I mean, but there's a difference. Again, the journalist can poison many more readers compared to the number of patients who may be poisoned by a physician. So let's say that there is an analogy, but at the same time, I mean, there's no proportion. And this means that there is a strong ethical responsibility. Quite obviously, we need to have appropriate laws, but we have most especially an ethical responsibility, most especially because fake news have always been there, you know, in the genesis. Adam and Eve are asked, is it true that God asked you not to eat the trees in the garden? This is fake news. And fake news are characterized by mimesis. I mean, these news don't appear to be immediately fake. Quite to the contrary, they appear to be real, true. That is why it is very important to talk about this strong ethical responsibility. It could be because, you know, there are different laws in the world. The US are one story, the EU is quite another story. And Italy still has to actually understand what laws it should pass. And on top of that, you know, 
there is a huge economic imbalance between the traditional media, i.e. the media that build up high-profile public opinion and that plethora of blogs and websites which build the social debate and more often than not this hinges around non-existent themes or, you know, negligible themes. You know, I never thought about Adam and Eve, but that's a good point. <laughs> <laughs> the first, the birth of fake news. <laughs> you know, it occurred to me as, as I was looking out here and I was thinking about what, what the Monsignor was saying is that uh, this is a room of physicians, scientists, researchers, for the most part. And what is the number one quality that a researcher and a scientist has? Skepticism. Skepticism. Show me the data. Prove it to me. Somehow, when we go to the internet and we confer with Dr. Google, um, we lose our, our skepticism for some reason. And we don't have that same degree of, you know what, this, this doesn't sound quite right. So I say to you, you must be as skeptical when you go to the internet as you are when you hear presentations at a scientific meeting, some of the presentations here. I saw a lot of people when, in some of the presentations going, mm, I'm not so sure. Um, <laughs> that's okay, that's the way it's supposed to be. This is also a room full of influencers. We have some very powerful influencers in this room. So my call to action, not unlike Mehmet's, is you need to go out and tell other people what fake news is, not just the political fake news. We, we, we know about that. But there's a lot of it out there. It's what, what do we call clickbait, right? Yep. It's out there, and you guys need to go out and be the Johnny Appleseeds. I don't know if we have an equivalent in, in Italy as, uh, for, for Johnny Appleseed. But to spread the word, to let other people know that this problem exists, it's huge, it's pernicious, and ultimately it's damaging to our society. So let me ask from two perspectives, from uh, the legal perspective and from uh, the ethical faith-based perspective. What should be the obligation of large internet companies that have the ability to begin to clean up the web to do that? Or should it be governments that play this role? As an example, large pharmaceutical companies are allowed to advertise in the US, but they're highly restricted in what they can say. And that must be really accurate with all the disclaimers. In many parts of the world, they're not allowed to advertise, so the vacuum is again filled by fake news. So, or, I, I, I use fake news, I know many of you recoil from that because it's been politicized, but I'm talking about really just made up material. So should this be something that we look to governments to clean up, do we, or how do we put more pressure on companies so that we don't kill the web, but allow it to become a safer neighborhood for not just people in this room, but the average person who maybe isn't trained to be skeptical might be able to safely traverse in. Thanks a lot. Um, <laughs> It's tough because company, when there's a lot of money at stake, you often, you, you just don't, people aren't going to change simply because they think it's the right thing to do. People meaning these large internet companies. They, are, they will slowly change because they feel that the ax may drop on them if they don't. And as you said, government regulation is a very blunt tool. Um, sometimes you need a little bit of a blunt tool to encourage people. Um, you know, I, I, I'm at, I mean, I'm, uh, I'm of a couple of minds about that. Can I just make one point? If Please. it was just innocently done and competitive, it's one thing. I showed you images of how our minds are hacked in order to create these responses. This, by the way, is the same way that our phones become addictive, right? It's not an accident. It's a lot of very careful research done on exactly how to get into our minds to burrow through the usual resistance. If it was just that billboard, I'd get it. But there are people who are very clearly designing tactics 
to change how we perceive reality. I don't think it's as innocent as do I let an ad go or not. If I was holding you up with a gun and taking your money, which is what happens when they click on the ads for me, that people get their money stolen, they get your credit card and they keep going. They're, they're, it's a little, it's not as innocent as access to information. Monsignor. I think that uh, this is also due to the change in development of the media system as a whole. I mean, in a traditional context, there used to be, you know, persons who had specific knowledge, competent knowledge, I mean, uh, scientists and physicians, and there used to be some sort of access to knowledge that, um, you know, had a specific pathway. In a context in which, uh, instead, uh, the digital media have grown, and in particular, you know, it is possible to have access to the net with simpler and simpler interfaces. We have uh, um, a knowledge in the web that uh, does not come through uh, by means of education. It's easily available. At times, you know, it is told through non-specific stories. And so, everybody has access to this sort of knowledge through these interfaces. So it's a different way of having access to knowledge. And this is precisely what has created this very complex situation, most especially in the medical arena. You know, anybody can decide what drugs to take, what uh, treatments to have, or what guru to become the victim of, because we know that the users of the uh, internet are not so skeptical, you know, they're not used to question things. Generally, you get together when you surf the internet simply because you may find like-minded persons or kindred souls, so to speak. And that is why, you know, we have have these blocks, uh, which are some uh, sort of corporations. Quite obviously, I try and read and disseminate the news and pieces of information which I believe are the ones that reward me because I'm a member of a given group. You know, it's all about affection, and it works quite a lot when it comes to disseminating negligible or fake news. And on on top of that, when it comes to medical communication, there is a huge difference between what we have on the internet and the relationship between the patient and the physician. Because, you know, um, when it comes to treatments, uh, well, they're individualized, they are personal. Because it is very important for a physician to be skilled and competent, and it is very important for the physician to have gained experience. But the greatness of a physician comes from identifying the specific treatment for the specific individual or person, as we say, we Christians. So medical information and communication is and ought to be personal. Instead, the internet is exactly the opposite. It's global. And as a result of this difference, you know, the information we find find on the internet is not good when it comes to medical communication because all of the patients are individuals. They're all different. Very short follow-up. Transparency. Does, does the, the church, Omar Sr. Vignano, do you feel strongly that there should be a call for transparency on the web among largest companies so we at least, everyone in this room and in the, on the planet knows how money is changing the system? <clears throat> yes, I do believe that this call is absolutely urgent. We have to find the right avenues, so to do. For example, the Italian avenue, which is very different from the US one, and I'm talking about, for example, the movies, is one of third parties 
or bodies or associations which assume the responsibility to certify a movie, for example, before launching it. And you know that these third parties, which ought to be independent or autonomous, are not so for the most part. And I think that it would be better instead to have a committee, for example, of the pharmaceutical companies or the makers of medical devices. You know, they should have an ex ante self-certification because this assumes individual and social responsibility and in this case there would be no delegated responsibility because otherwise you know um, if we continue to do like we do now we would have no responsibility at all and you know we would put all of the responsibility and liability upon these third parties instead of assuming it directly. Monsignor, thank you very, very much for the bold support, because I think we all need to hear it in this room. And my one call to action, and I'll speak for Max, I know he agrees, is there is a solution. It is transparency, whether it's through a committee structure, which is an intriguing one that I had not thought of, uh, or other types of bold oversight. I think it's incumbent on all of us as influencers to make it clear that's the least we expect, that these organizations function the way other big companies should, which is letting us at least understand how the business runs. Thank you both very, very much.